Okay. Well, welcome everyone to Nodely Salesforce Group, another Impact Salesforce start day session. And here with us, Philip Thais. Thank you, sir, for accepting this request. And Philip Thais is a founder of Tech I Tech Academy, and he is an independent consultant. The website of his website uh, is link is http itechacademy dot in. And today our session is on introduction into declarative automation tools. And this is me, our size is Kiran. I'm a Salesforce developer and 2x certified and a New Delhi Salesforce developer group. These are the uh, social media handles of New Delhi Salesforce group where you can uh, get updates and you can uh, get the content of the recordings, etc. And we will call it as hashtag impact Salesforce start day. And impact Salesforce start day was started as virtual Salesforce start day previously. And later it was not able to hear. Hello? Hello? Uh, are they able to hear? Hello? Hello? Yes, yeah. Sashi? Yeah, yeah. Are you able to hear, sir? Yes, yes, I can hear you, Sashi. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Up to the all the slides, uh, can you, uh, are you able to hear? I'm ready. Can I start? Yeah, yeah. One second, sir. I will. I will give that intro. Okay. One second. I will change my headphones. One second. Okay. Yeah. Hello. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I changed that one. Uh, give me five, two minutes, sir. I will share that. Okay. <clears throat> Talent Central. Talent Central is one of the best opportunity to get into the Salesforce ecosystem. It is one of the useful thing for friends who want to get into the Salesforce and many uh, successful stories from New Delhi Salesforce team also. Mentorship Center, who want to do a mentor uh, for uh, New Delhi Salesforce through that link. And this was a uh, hat, let's implement. It was one of the uh, initiative taken by New Delhi Salesforce group. And they join in New Delhi, yeah, generative Salesforce where you can get uh, updates and uh, everything. Where you, uh, these are the top contributors of New Delhi Salesforce group. And thank you everyone. And you can follow in this uh, social media handles and in YouTube, uh, the live rec recordings will be added soon. And the past recordings also there where you can view those and get content. And thank you, GreyOps and Cloud Vandana for, uh, as a sponsors. Thank you, everyone. Over to you, Philip, sir. Okay, and thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Shashi. Uh, Shashi. <laughs> Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to this uh, session on declarative uh, automation tools. Let me quickly share my screen. I think it is shared by now and open up the slide sets from the point where I will start. There we go. So good morning. Let me first quickly introduce, introduce myself. So my name is Philip Thies. I'm quite sure that some of you have followed my previous uh, session on security, uh, where we covered the different layers of security. Well, in fast, uh, at fast speed, of course, because we only have a, a small, small hour, uh, which will be the case today, because I have an, a next uh, session in less than one hour, actually, a private session. So again, uh, we don't have that much uh, time, but. The idea of these sessions is, since I don't know the audience, to, to give you uh, an, an, an introduction, an overview, uh, to make sure that people which are new uh, to the, in this case, automation tools, have an overview of what kind of automation tools you can find within Salesforce, but also for people that already have knowledge of automation tools, at least uh, refresh uh, their knowledge and being able to pinpoint when or why which operation tool should uh, be used. So my name is Philip. I'm currently in Spain, where I live part of the time, Spain, south of Europe. 
Um, I'm actually Belgian. Yeah? I also live in Belgium part of the time where I have my own company partnered with Salesforce. And one of the things that I do is supply sale. I'm a supplier, a Salesforce supplier for trainings. I deliver most of the trainings in most of the clouds. Eh? For instance, uh, this week I'm delivering a marketing cloud connector training, which uh, dis discusses the integration between marketing clouds and the CRM platform. So there is much more to Salesforce than just automation tools, as you all know. But I thought it was similar to the previous session on security, where we had that overview of security, I thought it might, might be a good idea to give you again, as I said before, a refresh on automation tools. And focus is that it will take about a bit more than half an hour uh, to quickly quickly run through and differentiate, differentiate uh, between the different automation tools. Actually, you can see the automation tools on uh, this first slide, uh, we're talking about workflows, process builder, flow builder, and often when I deliver admin essentials, but even with admin advanced trainings, I notice that people are confused, especially between process builder and flow builder, when to use one, when to use the other, but also even be be between workflows and process builder. What is the nature of process builder? Why, why, why should we start using process builder? That's typically a question which is asked by, let's say, older. I'm an older administrator myself as well. I date from the classic time, yeah. But uh, definitely older uh, administrators will still often prefer workflows. I call these three the generic automation tools, the generic declarative automation tools. Why generic? Because they do not focus on one specific task. Yeah, we can apply them on every cloud. We can apply them within every every cloud, even within communities. Or I should, I should say nowadays within experience uh, builder, we can uh, use flows. Yeah, good. The other ones are more specific. Yeah? You can see that we also have approval pro processes. You definitely know eh, about approval processes. I like them a lot. Eh? They are based on the same core as workflows, um, support the same type of actions as workflows, and often underestimated. Eh? We have simple approval processes, which are one-step approval processes. Multi-step approval processes can be quite complex. We will not have the time to go into the approval process. Same for the web to lead, web to case, and email to case. But it's, of course, important that you know these exist as well. I have seen situations where organizations start developing web to lead, whereas uh, it is already available within, uh, within the platform without any additional cost. Apart from web to lead, web to case, we also have email to case, very similar to uh, web to case. Once you are able to set up web to case, it is an easy step to set up email to case as well. Yeah? So if we just quickly run through the interface, I've just quickly opened an organization. If we're talking about these things, where will we find them? So for those of you uh, who are new to this, uh, remember in the setup uh, within uh, process or under the process automation menu, you will find the different automation, the, the generic automation tools. Remember, Appro approval process, well, approval processes are not generic, but uh, let's say flows uh, work is one of the generic ones and workflow rules and we also have process builder as you can see approval processes can be found over here as well the other ones are a bit more hidden since web to case web to lead are part of a specific cloud feature of a specific cloud we find these underneath feature settings as you can see if i scroll for instance to the marketing yeah, i will find web to lead uh, leads are child records of a campaign, marketing in other words, yeah? we will find the web to lead underneath the marketing, okay? And as you can see, just to give you an idea on how to set these up, same goes up for web to case, email to case. These type of automations have to do with assignment rules. You can imagine if someone leaves his details on the website, which will automatically become a lead within the platform, that lead needs to be assigned. As you know, a record cannot 
exist without owner, it be, needs to be assigned to either a user or a queue. So we have assignment rules, which will be, which will based on criteria assign that generated lead to a user or a queue. Okay. We also have lead auto response rules. Yeah? Lead auto response rules. They are basically a thank you email. Someone registered on the site. Yeah. On our website, receives a thank you email. Thank you for registering on our site and leaving your details. Uh, if you have questions, uh, please uh, send the mail to whatever. Yeah, you see. So we have lead assignment rules, lead auto response rules, and then we have web to lead, which is the actual. If I select here, this is this is actually activating web to lead. Okay, so you can see that you can edit. And then you can enable, in this case, it is enabled. You can enable web to lead. Okay. We can even generate the HTML code yeah, from over here. So that code can be generated. And we can, this is uh, done by create, uh, the create web to lead form where you can find all the fields for a lead record. You select the fields that you want to appear on or want to put on the site on, on your website automatically the code will be generated you develop or you give this to your developer your website developer they integrate it into your site takes less than 40 minutes yeah? 40 45 minutes the base setup okay <clears throat> same goes up for web to case same goes up for email to case one big diff one big or small difference email to case of course we will not capture the lead on the website using HTML code. In this case, we will capture the lead uh, uh, or this, the case better based on, on, on an email, okay? And there you have a couple of choices, but that would bring us too far. But again, once the, that, that case is captured from the email, we have case assignment rules, case auto response rules for a thank you email. Yeah. We have registered or logged your case. We will reply to you within four hours, for instance. And of course, typical for a case is also the escalation rule. If the case is not solved within two hours, for instance, or within four hours, uh, we, can we can escalate it or reassign it to another queue or another user, tier two support, uh, level two support, for instance. So these are the specific, the, the main specific declarative automation tools they do not require coding okay so approval process again maybe on on a later on session we might dig into the detail of or the details of an approval process what i want to do now is i want to focus on that these three generic ones yeah so let's first have a look at the workflow rule the workflow rule is our old friend yeah you can see the steps in setting up the workflow rule on this slide so, so there are always criteria we need to define when the workflow rule starts up yeah and <clears throat> there are two types of criteria we have evaluation criteria and rule criteria so we have to define when that rule becomes active yeah at what point becomes the rule will become active second step does that rule does the actions within the rule will be applied based on the record that activated the rule yeah? so it might be that the record will not apply to the rule criteria in that case no actions are carried out simple example let's say that we need to send an email to our vp of sales yeah? whenever an opportunity is created with an amount larger than one million dollar at that point, I can imagine the VP of sales would want to know. Yeah. So you can imagine that we want to check the evaluation criteria. In other words, is when we create or edit the opportunity. So every time it is created, every time it is updated yeah, or edited, yeah, we want to double check the amount of that opportunity. That would be the evaluation criteria. The second rule criteria will check whether the record applies for the actions yeah if the opportunity amount is below 1 million it will not apply if it's above 1 million it will apply and the mail will be sent so that's the difference between the rule criteria and the evaluation criteria or evaluation and rule criteria so we have criteria we have actions 
We also have a default workflow user. Often people ask me, what is that default work workflow user that I need to define when I create a workflow rule? Well, there are two types of actions. We have immediate actions and we have time dependent actions. The default workflow user will be used whenever yeah, a time dependent action needs to be carried out. It's like a service, let's call it a service account. Often we will use the admin account for it. So it's the user responsible, let's call it kind of a system account, responsible for carrying out time dependent actions. Yeah? We can have one immediate action block, 10 time dependent action blocks. Yeah? So in, in, in total, we can, have, uh, we can have 11 different action blocks for a workflow. Yeah? Every action block yeah, is able to contain up to 40 four zero actions. So the workflow in total can support 440 actions, which is quite a lot. So all sounds nice so far. Never forget to activate it, by the way. That's an important step, of course. If you wonder why it doesn't work, activate. Activation is typical for automation. Automation stuff within Salesforce, you can activate and deactivate. You always have the, op the, 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 the possibility to switch off automation of course or an automation component so remember structure of that workflow rule criteria actions 11 action blocks if i did, if i reference an action block it means for instance the immediate action block and then you have an action block five days after rule trigger date yeah? every date field in the record that triggered the rule or that triggered the workflow rule can be used as a reference points point to define a time block, you see? Good, so that's the structure of the workflow rule. It's a very old friend of us. If you've been working with Salesforce for a long time, uh, we, we are very fond of these workflow rules. They used to be magic in the past, okay? Here, next slide. Here you see these evaluation criteria. Created, created, and every time it's edited, created, and at any time it's edited to subsequently meet criteria. So these criteria will define when that workflow rule becomes active. Yeah. Often again, confusion. Confusion is not with created. Confusion is between the, the second and the third yeah, uh, setting. Created and every time it's edited, created and any time it's edited to subsequently meet criteria. People don't know what the difference is. Yeah. Well, the difference is quite logic. Assume my mail that is sent to the VP of sales, if I would have selected, created, and every time it's edited, well, it might be quite annoying for my VP of sales. Every time someone edits that record, that rule is triggered, criteria, rule criteria are applied, action is met if the, the amount is above 1 million, my VPs, or VP of sales mailbox will be full of mails, of course. Every edit will cause a mail to be sent. That's why often we will need the third one. The third one is like a reset condition. Yeah? Once I'm above 1 million, that mail will no longer be sent as long as I stay above an amount of 1 million. When the customer suddenly cancels half a million, I drop below 1 million. Yeah? Nothing happens yet. Then a couple of days later, customer changes his mind again and again adds half a million and I'm above one million again. At that point, I will send the mail again. I notify basically, it's like a reset condition. I warn my VP that again for that opportunity, the amount is above one million. So you see, Automatically, we will often use that third one. It's a very use, useful one. Second one is less useful. Yeah? Certainly not with notifications, with sending of emails or creation of tasks. That would rather be something that we use for field updates to make sure that a field update is always in sync with the criteria for the field update. So these are the three evaluation criteria. And then we have rule criteria. I'm not going to read through all of these, uh, um, but rule criteria are very identifiable when you, in, in general, when you read the business request. Look at the first one. If the number of filled positions equals the number of total positions on a job, 
update the job status field to field. So we are comparing, in this case, it will probably be a formula. We are comparing fields, huh? field positions equals total positions. If that's true, apply the actions, you see? So it's always something within, let's use that second one again. If mileage expenses associated with, with visiting a customer site are 35 cents per mile, that's already a condition, 35 cents per mile, they exceed $1,000, automatically update the approval required field to required. They need to, they need to ask for approval. Yeah. Of course, this can be picked up uh, by an approval uh, process. Yeah. Good. <clears throat> so you see conditions. Conditions that can be quite complex. Conditions can be based on formulas. Conditions are often very simple. Yeah. Highly depends on uh, the, the workflow or the business request that you need to solve, of course. Good, let me quickly check the time for my timing. Yeah, I'm think, I think I'm still more or less on time. Then finally, you have these actions. And you see four actions. It's not much. Email can be sent. We can do a field update. We can create a task. We can send an outbound message. Okay, good. What, what can I say about these actions? Well, 20 years ago, this was magic. Yeah. Today, often used, still often used. To be honest, other stuff can do better. This is too limited. Yeah. So what is the, and I think the next slide is already, yeah, it's not process builder. We'll yeah, just uh, to know what I'm telling you. Yeah or to, to, to do my timing right, let's put it that way. So what is my conclusion here? If I look at the actions, if I look at the way that workflow rule works, what, what is my conclusion? Well, it sounds quite nice, but that's because I don't know anything else yet. You know, we haven't seen the other possibilities yet. So yes, it looks nice. Am I going to use it? Well, probably, if I don't know anything better, but the conclusion actually is no, there are too much limitations. It's, it, it's, it is, it's already passed by other solutions. Think of process builder. In which way is it passed? Well, for every set of criteria, I need an, a different workflow rule. So if I have multiple criteria on an object, I need to set up a workflow rule for each of these criteria. So I, I can end up in the end with quite a lot of workflow rules, which is a problem in, so, in some uh, organizations. They have a massive amount of workflow rules. The administrator, that creator or developer that created these workflow rules left the organization. They don't know what's in these workflow rules. They often work together. A field update can trigger another workflow rule that will again do something. You know? So they can be chained together. And of course, the organization is very afraid that if they pull out one of these workflow rules, the entire structure will collapse. Yeah? So too many workflow rules. Another limitation is the actions that you can carry out. As you can see, it's limited. Sending of an email. I can't create a record. I can create, yeah, I can create a task. It's limited to creating a task. That's the only type of record that I can create with a workflow rule. Field update is nice, but it's also very limited. I can update a field on the record that triggered the workflow rule or on a parent record. That's it. Yeah. The only thing that the workflow is capable to do, to do and no other tool can do is sending an outbound message. An outbound message is a very simple way to create. It's similar to creating an email template, you could say, or an email. It's a very simple way to send record information to the API where an interface can pull it out and use it in an external software. Quick example. For instance, my opportunity is closed one. I have an outbound message that will send opportunity details, number, amount, um, uh, products, etc., through the outbound message or using the outbound message through the API to my invoicing software. For us administrators, it's easy. 
because it's very simple to create an outbound message. For us developers, I also deliver developer trainings. So for a developer, it's easy to work with that outbound message. Very straightforward. Yeah. Now, unfortunately for the workflow rule, in winter 22, the flow will also start supporting the outbound message. So I think it's more or less goodbye for the workflow rule. So what is the lesson that we need to learn from the workflow rule? Do we need to know it? Yes. Do we need to have respect for it? To have respect for it? Yes, definitely. Because it served us well for many, many, many years. Still today, it can be used. There's no reason eh, to say, well, you can't use it. But it's passed by other tools. You know? It is already taken over by other, uh, other, other tools, as we will see. Okay. So my lesson to you is, for a customer, in a customer organization, avoid the workflow rule. Okay. I can't say it's obsolete, of course. I'm not allowed to say this. Only Salesforce will decide when it's obsolete. But for me, in my world, the workflow rule is obsolete. Okay? And time to say goodbye. Okay. We still need to know it because lots of organizations still use it. Lots of old admins still create workflow rules. And we need to be able, if we are consultants, we need to be able to understand the workflow rule. Okay. So, Today, I already explained that default workflow user for time dependent actions, do not forget to activate the workflow rule. Of course, we don't have the time to do examples, unfortunately, because of the limited time that we have, but feel free, of course, uh, you know Trailhead, feel free uh, to, uh, to visit Trailhead and do some uh, projects or, or, or modules on or trails on automation, including workflow rules so if we are not if we are no longer using workflow rules what should we use then process builder that's the first step yeah. remember process builder also think of the fact that whenever salesforce develops new functionality that functionality is not developed for the workflow rule the workflow rule is not changing anymore yeah you see they don't say it's obsolete but they don't really change it. It's, it's, it's the same already for many years. Every development effort is put into process builder yeah? and flow, uh, lightning flow builder. Yeah? So here you can see process builder. I don't have that many slides for process builder because it's very similar to the workflow. Yeah? It's a point and click tool for automation that uses triggers. We call them triggers in this case. One second, I'm gonna close my door because they're mowing the lawn. I should have known I live on a golf course in Spain. So they are basically mowing the lawn on a daily basis. So let's uh, let's rephrase. So triggers are in this case similar to the evaluation criteria on the workflow rule. You see? Identifies when the process will run, when the record is created, when the record is created or edited. There are other ones you will see. It can also be launched by another process. So if you test building process builder you will you will find multiple types of triggers but these are the ones uh, that are most commonly used similar to the workflow and we have criteria immediate uh, oh, cr criteria that will determine whether or not uh, to run the actions and similar immediate actions time dependent actions so my conclusion is everything the workflow rule does Process Builder can do as well and much better. Yeah. Let's have a look. Why better? Look, these are the actions that we can do. A lot more actions than we can do with workflows. Much more flexible. Also a very different interface. Actually, Process Builder was the first component within the platform yeah, that was I think someone was started started to write on my slide. It was not me. Uh, um, so please uh, refrain from uh, comments uh, on my slides, please. So again, uh, where was it? So now I lost my track. Eh? <laughs> so the, the process builder is able to do uh, record creation, 
which we couldn't do with the workflow rule. We can, we can create any record. We can update multiple records, which we can't do with the workflow rule. Workflow rule can only execute one action on one record, yeah? the record itself or the parent. Yeah? Here we can even create records. Yeah? Here we can even update records on any related record, not just the parent, no, on any related record. Yeah? And not just on one related record, on all related records. An example would be if you have an account with many opportunities, if the account billing address changes, I can update all opportunities in one process. Okay, so you see, much more flexible. Of course, we can also send the email, similar to the workflow, but we can also post to chatter. We can send custom notifications within the interface. You have these, that little bell icon huh, that contains custom, or that, that shows notifications. We can send uh, custom notifications, you see? Okay, that's correct. Uh, I, I see a couple of... Uh, you should use the process builder. I see a couple of uh, questions or a couple of remarks. Yes, you're right. Uh, workflow rules are uh, uh, sorry. Um, workflow rules are evaluated after process builder execution. I think it's the other way around. Yeah, but I'm not going to uh, to double check now because we don't have the time. Yeah. So creation of the record, updating records, sending mails, post to chatter, sending of custom notifications. Using of an action, we can trigger a quick action and we can also submit for approval. This is a very powerful one. I always use it to submit for approval. Yeah? Whenever approval is required on a record, I use process builder to detect when that approval is needed. Because my users, they often forget to click the link submit for approval or the button submit for approval. You see? So I, I will often uh, do it or most of the time do it using process builder. This is not everything. Look, list grows. It's two slides already in terms of actions. Yeah? And that list continues to grow. It can launch a flow. It can launch another process. It can call Apex, yeah? which is very similar. The Apex calling is very similar to the outbound message. We can use it to integrate, yeah? to build interfaces in Apex with other tools. Yeah? We can also manage quick documents. And again, that list of actions keeps growing continuously which we don't see happening for workflow rules. Yeah. If you look at the process structure, this is the structure of, uh, uh, I'm quickly seeing whether I can, I don't know who made the annotations. Uh, so, can uh, quick, so can someone clean them up? Uh, I don't know where um, you are. Yeah, anyway, I'm gonna continue. Process builder structure, here you can see, Object is opportunity. This is what we call a criteria node. You see, closed one and high value. If true, execute immediate actions. And then we have scheduled action blocks. And here it stops. Yeah. But we can also continue, evaluate next criteria. So we can have multiple of these criteria blocks. So one such a block represents one workflow rule. You see, if I would have to replace this by a workflow rule, one block represents a workflow. So if I have a second set of criteria, I would need a second workflow and a third. So organizations with many workflow rules, if they move towards process builder, they will highly reduce the number of processes, the number of rules, yeah? because one object can support multiple criteria sets. Okay, we can consolidate. And nowadays, everything is about consolidation. Consolidation makes management easier, managing these rules easier. Also, remember, it has version management. If you create a process, you can keep up to 50 versions, okay? which is similar to the flow that we will see next. Also, Flow Builder supports 50 versions. Basically, Process Builder is running on the same core as uh, the flow, the lightning flow. Yeah? So you can have up to 50 versions. If you reach 50, you can delete all the ones or you can just copy that uh, process and continue uh, from a new set of versions. Yeah? So you just give it a different name. In other words, with Process Builder, I can go back to the path to a working situation. If my current version is not working or my current version is causing problems, I can go back to one of the previous, let's say, major 
versions which worked well so flexible you have auditing you have version management okay good some people will say it's something that we need to keep in mind that for highly uh, performant many uh, actions uh, at the same time let's say uh, an action that 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 is quite quite resource consuming that workflows are a bit less impacting on the platform that might still be well, there's a lot of discussion about this but that might still be a reason to uh, choose for workflow in very specific cases i would not recommend it what i see happening in the maybe not so near future is that workflows will disappear okay at some point especially now that the outbound message especially now that the outbound message is uh is going to is going is, is going to be supported in win winter 22 by flows as well one more remark i can see a couple of remarks by the way in the chat but i'm not able to uh, not able to to respond to them due to the limited time good so i hope uh, this uh, is clear so far one thing one more thing you can also re this this is a very interactive interface you can rearrange the criteria notice uh, with the action blocks another thing is in in workflows we don't know the order of the actions we don't know in which order an action within one time block will be carried out the only thing that we know in the workflow is that it, it will first perform field updates followed by the other actions this is different for process builder actions will be carried out in the way they are listed the order that is listed will be the order in which action actions will be carried out so if we if i would have multiple actions underneath draft contact contract it will start with draft contract and then the second and then the third clear okay so that's process builder and then finally we have flow builder let me quickly check the time once more yeah I think we're almost yeah. uh, almost there so flow builder so this is flow builder well, when to use flow builder whenever process builder is too limited yeah? process builder of course is declarative it's for people that do not know coding it's for people that let's say make their first steps in automation it's quite simple straightforward easy to use so you have to build some experience of course and you will you will learn to appreciate more and more because quite a lot is possible if you design your your processes smart in a smart way flow builder for me flow builder is development yeah it is graphical development you will even have to define for instance variables you can see also an element that talks about assignment you also have to assign uh, values to variables for instance you can loop through different variables different records uh, you have decisions uh, yeah. so it is it looks like development it is a lot easier because it's graphical where we don't have to write the code we use the nodes yeah. and it is very powerful so what how powerful is it well look at the possible uh data actions we can create records we can update records we can get records get records is basically uh, performing a lookup retrieving a record yeah? modifying that record storing that record again so updating that record it's the only way we can delete records flows can be used to delete records yeah so these elements as you can see are the elements that we can use on flows they can even call subflows yeah. subflows you can you can compare to subroutines modules that are often reused you can call another flow from within the flow in that case uh, that flow will or that 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 other other flow will be started up actions within that other flow will be carried out yeah and then we return back to the source flow you see you can you can use like modular flows you can build flows using different subflows like modules yeah i prefer subflows when you have large automations because it's easier to manage and yeah? then you can define smaller comparts compartments yeah? that you tie together in kind of a master flow that will contain all the necessary subflows easier to troubleshoot easier to manage so you can see this is quite you can debug 
similar to a script you can even debug. Yeah? So as you can see, there's a lot possible. For me, in my mind, yeah, if you look at the data that, that you have, what the flow can do is it can use all the data which is in your database. It can interact with the user on the screen to modify, update, delete, whatever, to modify in general, to manipulate the data, and then it can store the data again. So whenever you're happy with the business logic, the business logic is how a record is created, updated, looked up, and deleted. So if you're happy with how the business logic functions, the flow can do everything. Yeah? It pulls data out of the database, interacts with the portal, and then stores data again in the database. Yeah? In between the pull and the store, the data gets manipulated and can interact with external data. You see? Very powerful. Whenever you manipulate data, often flow will be enough. Yeah? Two types of flows. Also, the types of flows, by the way, are growing. If you look at the flow here, quick, I, I have to go to automation again. So we have the, whoops, where is it? The flow. I think two years ago, we only had one type of flow, screen flow. Yeah or the flow in general. Look, nowadays we have screen-based flows, flows that can be scheduled, flows that are record-triggered. Uh, record-triggered uh, means uh, update of record, creation of a record, platform event. Uh, when a platform event is, it can listen in other words to platform events uh, and they can trigger a flow. They can also be auto-launched. Uh, so there are many ways to nowadays launch flows as you can see yeah? so they are hugely developing in uh, flows yeah? extending the capabilities of lightning flow builder in general for me there are two types of flows you have the front end flow and the back end flow if you never used flows and you want to start working with flows start with front end flows they also call them call scripting give you an example if you have a user yeah, or, for instance, a support rep receives a call from a customer. Customer wants to log a case. Call, call scripting means that we are guiding that support rep through a set of actions, questions that he or she needs to ask the customer. Yeah? What is your contact? What is your email address? What is your issue? Yeah? And so on. So we guide them through a couple of screens. Answers are captured by the flow. And... At the end, we will automatically create a case. That's a typical example used for case creation, used for lead creation, used for opportunity, for everything, for every record that's created. You can use this front end. And then you have back end flows. Back end flows perform some operation on the platform in the back end based on something that happens at the level of the data. For example, you can have flows that assist in um, approval assignment, approval assignment during the approval process, flows that detect duplicates. So flows that operate on the data in the backend without interacting with the user. So these are they are the, they tend to be the more uh, more complex ones. Yeah. Remember, yeah, if you start working with flow builder, focus on the front. And so the call scripting flows. Uh, you see, the, these, uh, these are using screens, of course. Huh? So you can see we have interaction, logic, data element types. Clear? So very powerful. One remark, if you start working with flows, don't expect that you will know how it works in one day. Yeah? It needs hands-on. It needs experience. And you need to start somewhere. Huh? start simple i always one of my models in life is start small think big yeah so start small yeah and step by step you will increase your knowledge of flows okay let me double check the time well it's quarter past uh, eight i think as i said uh, i have to leave in max uh, 14 uh, i 10 minutes actually uh, I hope this was a useful uh, overview of, uh, of declarative automation tools. There's much more to tell about these, uh, these tools, eh? but at least uh, I tried to give you uh, in, 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 in a short amount of time uh, 
an, an overview, a useful overview of uh, automation, declarative automation. Okay. So I think Sashi will take over now. There's still a Kahoot uh, where you can win a voucher, I think, for yeah. certification. I'm not sure. And I hope to see you can again in one you? of my following sessions. Okay. Yes, uh, Sashi, I need to stop sharing. Yeah. Anyone have any doubts? You can ask, guys, for five minutes. If not, I can start the Kahoot. I will mute now, so I'll leave it. I will stop sharing. I will leave it to you, yeah. Sashi. Yeah, yeah. Okay. thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you for your attention, and maybe see you next time in one of my other uh, sure. sessions. Yeah, we will collaborate again, sir. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Can you stop sharing, sir? Yeah. This is the Kahoot pin, guys. You can join. We will start in a minute. I think everyone are joining. Okay, let me log that, please. Which actually is not supported by process builder? What the answers? Yo, that the other. Priyanka, Ravi, and Anjali Giri Vikram. Which text is not supported by workflow? I think 45. 34 are right. And Ravi is in the lead. Priyanka Anjali. Which user is able to execute time dependent actions in workflow? Two answers, forty-four answers. Okay, eight not correct. And Ravi is in the Priyanka Anjali Vikram. 
what type of element does not exist in flow builder Thirty-two answers are there. Forty-two. Forty-four. Yeah. Okay. Eight are correct. Priyanka is in the lead. Ravi, Sri Anjali, Shailendra, Pooja is having street title. What identifies when a process will run? Two answers. And eleven are correct. And <clears throat> Sri Anjali is in the third. Second is Ravi. And first is Priyanka. Priyanka, yeah, okay. Priyanka, can you share me your mail ID into the chat box? And thank you very much, Philip, sir, for accepting our request. You are welcome, Sashi. Yeah, we will call Congratulations, you. Priyanka. Yeah, congrats, Priyanka. And hope we will do another session in future, sir. Definitely will. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll discuss uh, the next one later on. Yeah, okay. sure, sure. I, I have to find a subject first. <laughs> yeah. There are so many subjects in Salesforce. There's so much to tell. Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. And Good luck, everyone. And maybe see you in one of the next sessions. And please follow New Delhi Salesforce Group and YouTube channel and in Twitter also, Yeah, where we can, you can find the updates of uh, coming sessions, upcoming sessions. And thank you very much, guys. Thank you very much, sir. And bye bye. Bye, bye everyone. Bye bye. Thank you very much.